Well, it's great to be together with you this morning. Life is, uh, is not easy. In fact, it takes a lot of wisdom and discernment to live well in this world. And we have seen the need for this as we have uh, spent the last few months in the book of James. Uh, James was very concerned about uh, the active side of our faith. And he speaks to all sorts of tests and challenges that we encounter in this life. Therefore, in order to live well in this world, we need a good grasp on truth. We need to understand the difference between right and wrong. And secondly, we need uh, the fortitude, the strength, the will to practice what is right and to avoid what is wrong. And this is not easy. And one of the reasons this is not easy is because as we journey on the the narrow road of the Christian faith, there are all kinds of traps and pitfalls along the way. So what do I mean by traps? Every couple years, there's this one uh, junior youth lesson I would do that demonstrates this pretty well. And what I would do is I would find some kind of a, a narrow corridor of sorts. Uh, last time I did this, I used one of the aisles in the sanctuary. And then I would set up a simple obstacle course. And the obstacles would consist of set mouse traps and one big rat trap. Now, under each trap, I would put a label. And the labels would have words such as lying, gossiping, Cheating, uh, lust, pornography, greed, disobeying your parents, holding grudges, complaining. There's all kinds of stuff. And then I would spend a couple minutes demonstrating the power of these traps because it's important for them to know, for all of us to know, that these are not toys that should be trifled with. And then there were two exercises we would do with these mouse traps and labels. The first one is I would invite any of the youth who are interested to take off their shoes and walk through the the maze, the path. And most would walk through quite cautiously and carefully. In fact, I was counting on this. Otherwise, I may have received some phone calls after that. But then there was always a few that really wanted to, like, push the boundaries, and they would get as close as they could to those traps without setting them off. Hmm. I'll save talking about that for another time. But the second exercise that we did, I'll save that for a few minutes as well. This morning, I want to talk about one of these traps. A trap that can deeply affect us. A trap that has the ability to hold us in bondage and to rob us of joy. A trap that prevents us from living in peace with God and with one another and even with ourselves a trap that greatly hinders our future relationships. I'm talking about the trap of unforgiveness. And the big question I want to explore with you this morning is, why is it important to forgive each other? So we're going to look this morning at 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 to 11. So I'll invite you to find that in your Bibles or on your electronic devices. I'll be reading from the NIV. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 to 11. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So in this passage, the Apostle Paul is addressing a unique situation. Someone in the church has caused some form of grief in the church community. Now, this was not a person who would have been, like, just exploring the Christian faith. Uh, This would not have been a brand new believer. This would have been a committed member of the church. 
And Paul does not specify who it is or exactly what had been done. That being said, the original audience who would have heard this message, they would have known exactly what situation Paul was referring to. And it could have been a moral uh, lifestyle sin issue, similar to what Paul addressed to them in a previous letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Most Bible scholars believe that a different, this is, this is referring to a different person and situation than 1 Corinthians 5, but the situation could have been also an issue of someone being divisive in the church. That was a big deal at the time and still is, but someone who was hindering the unity and the well-being of the church. And so maybe it was something like uh, excessive complaining about the way things were being done or complaining about Paul himself. Maybe it involved teaching false doctrines. Maybe he was seeking to divide the church in another way. But whatever the issue was, as we will see in this passage, it appears as though Paul feels the need to extend forgiveness himself to this individual, even though he wasn't physically present with them. So in verse 6, it's implied as though the church had responded to this situation in some way. Uh, There was some kind of discipline or punishment that was given to this person because of their actions or attitudes. And it appears as though this was a pretty public issue. And therefore, perhaps the punishment being described was a public rebuke. Uh, It's possible this person may have been removed from the church in order to keep those negative actions or attitudes from further hindering or damaging the church. But whatever the response was, In verse 7, Paul says, it's enough. Now. It's kind of assumed, I guess, that the person has expressed some form of remorse for their actions. And therefore, Paul says, now instead, now you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. It's time to forgive this person and restore this person into fellowship, into the church community. Because here's the thing. The purpose of church community, church discipline, the purpose of church discipline is always about restoration. And it's important uh, to protect the health and well-being of the church. And that's why Scripture gives us plenty of instructions on how to deal with sin issues when they creep into the church. And we see in this passage, sometimes actions are required in order to kind of get people's attention and to help change their ways. But the end result is always about reconciliation and leading them back to God. We want to restore people. We we desire forgiveness and peace. We want people to be in right relationship with God and with one another. And that is why we need to extend forgiveness and comfort. And so in verse 8, Paul goes on, he goes on further in in his encouragement to restore this person, and he says, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Right? I love that. Make sure this person knows that he is loved, that you are for him. And this is especially important after a person has wronged someone, when they are feeling such guilt and remorse and rawness. Make sure the person knows that they are loved. Because this is what you need. This is what I need. This is what our children need to know, especially after they've done something wrong. And so Paul, he's pretty passionate about his love for the church. And he says, it's one of the reasons he wrote to them, to see if they, were, they would be obedient in everything. That's what verse 9 is all about. Now he's not specifically call, talking about being obedient and calling out sin, but more so just being concerned and proactive about the health and the well-being of the church and all of its members. Because the church is meant to be a welcoming place for all people. And when there are things going on that hinder that mission, they need to be addressed and they need to be worked through. So then in verse 10, there's this one word that Paul repeats five times. Forgive. Now he's already instructed the church to forgive the offending person in verse 7, and here he makes another thing certain. 
if the church will forgive this person, well, he will as well. He is joining them in their forgiveness. That way, when Paul comes to visit again, there'll be no reason for division or awkwardness or hard feelings. He's not interested in carrying around a bunch of personal grudges. He wants to live in in grace and love and freedom with one another because this is what we have received from God and this is what we need to extend to others. And so when it comes to living in relationships with one another, this topic of forgiveness is one of the areas that I am most passionate about because it's so essential for living in healthy community with one another. And the reason for that is because of the selfishness and the pride that we continually battle with. We're so prone to hurt and offend each other. And this hurt and offense that we hold, it causes rifts within relationships. And these come from the big hurts. Things like betrayal and insults and cruel things that are spoken or done to one another. But they also come from the little things. Things such as simple as forgetting to recognize someone's birthday or doing something that bugs someone. And it can be tempted to it can be tempting to take these things that are relatively small and then make a big deal out of it. And the enemy of our souls, the devil, he loves to to twist those kind of things. He loves to take those small things like a forgotten birthday or some, someone who expressed some kind of untactful political comment that you thought was insulting, and then make you think the worst. They forgot your birthday because they don't care about you. Or all they do is think about themselves. Or they're so ignorant in all their views. These are the things the enemy whispers to us. And when a person lets this grow and fester, it becomes increasingly nasty. It's kind of like that mysterious bad smell that you discover in your fridge one day. You can't place it, so you kind of ignore it, and you hope it just goes away. But it seems as though it just gets worse. And then, one day you find that rotting onion in the back at the bottom there. You go to it, and you discover, oh no, it's growing mold and gross stuff on it. And it's infected the onions next to it already. And your first instinct is to shut that fridge and hope someone else will deal with it. (laughs) Choosing to live in anger and bitterness is kind of like that. And what's more is that people who live in anger and bitterness toward others are just that much more easily offended by the next thing in life. See, hurt people hurt people and are hurt by people. However, people who are quick to forgive or who are actively searching their hearts to forgive people, they are not offended as easily. And so I preached on this topic of forgiveness back in November. And I thought it would be good to circle back to this topic again. And the reason for that is because, number one, it's just so important for us in our lives. It's important for relationships. And some of you are still holding on to hurts that have been done to you. And this is a big issue in our lives. And secondly, now that we have more or less moved on from COVID and the restrictions and all that stuff, it's important that we really move on. We need to move on from the baggage that we have been holding on to. The hurts the frustrations, the offense, and the divisions that some of us have experienced through uh, our differing views and through our comments. We need to forgive people in our lives because it's so good and so freeing to live in peace. And because the next issue that will seek to divide us, it will come soon enough. They always do. Therefore, why is it important to forgive each other? And so Paul, he shares a couple of reasons why we need to forgive. First, he says in verse 7, for the sake of the offender, so that he or she will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. 
Now, this excessive sorrow that Paul is talking about can cause a person to distance themselves from the church and from supportive and caring people in their lives. And it can cause a person to turn to unhealthy practices to try to cope with or drown out those sorrows or the shame that they are experiencing. And it can lead a person to try to cope with things such as alcohol or drugs or find a different group of friends who will uh, be there for that person. Then they might lead them down a, a destructive path. But when, we, but when sin is recognized and when we can extend forgiveness, it's extending an olive branch and inviting them back in. And sometimes, sometimes depending on what this person has done, this process needs to happen slowly. Uh, sometimes it has to happen carefully and with much accountability. But for the sake of the offender, forgiveness is necessary to be genuinely welcomed back into the community without all kinds of awkwardness and shame. And then to follow the advice of Paul that he gives in verse 8, reaffirm your love for that person. Let them know that you are for them, that you desire what is best for them. Secondly, forgiveness is necessary for the sake of the church, for the community of believers. Now, just like Forgiveness is necessary for a family to truly work through some of the hurt and the hard feelings. It is necessary for the church too. And so the language that Paul uses in verse 11 is quite interesting. See, Paul is pointing out a very eye-opening truth. See, unforgiveness is playing right into Satan's schemes. And what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to do the same thing he's been trying to do since Genesis 3. He's trying to incite God's people to fight, to accuse one another, throw each other under the bus, talk bad about them behind their backs, anything to divide and destroy God's people. Because if Satan can cause the church to act that way, well, they'll be totally ineffective in their mission to reach others. So how do you keep people from reaching out? You get them fighting within. Distract, divide, destroy. That is what Satan is trying to do in the church. And spreading a spirit of unforgiveness is a powerful tactic in making that happen. It's kind of like a beachhead in the church. A beachhead is an area of land near a sea or a river that an attacking army has taken control of. And once they take control of it, the attacking army can then use that space to continue to move forward into enemy territory. And perhaps the most famous example of this is D-Day during World War II. On June 6, 1944, 156,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. And many troops died securing that beachhead. But once they secured it, that beachhead was instrumental in taking back more and more territory until they had victory. And this is a bit like how Satan uses an unforgiving spirit in a person or in the wider body of the church. Unforgiveness gives Satan a beachhead from which he can operate in the church or in a person's life. And then there he will launch further attacks. And you see as bitterness begins to take root, it affects all kinds of areas of our lives. It begins to affect all of our relationships. And therefore we need to forgive Forgive for the sake of the offender. Forgive for the well-being of the church. And third, we need to forgive because Christ has forgiven us. In Romans 5 verse 8 it says, But God demonstrates his own love for, in this, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we sorted and fixed all our problems. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God reached to, out to us as as rebellious and stubborn and prone to sin as we are. And he sent his son to us. And Jesus came in the fullness of God. He came into this world in all of our sin and our mess. And Jesus, he didn't just tell everyone that you got to just stop doing bad things. He knew we needed a lot more than that. We needed a savior. Someone to rescue and redeem us. Jesus knew we needed freedom from 
this sin and the death and the hurt that it so frequently causes. And so Jesus was willing to take upon himself the sin and the shame and the consequences. The consequences that we are helpless against because we are fully guilty of sinning against God. But Jesus was willing to go to the cross to reconcile us to God. And he did this so that we could experience forgiveness from God. And so that is, that is the extent Jesus went to in order to make a way for us to be forgiven and have peace with God. And God calls us to extend forgiveness to others in our lives. So Jesus gave his life to open a way for you and I to be forgiven. And it does, it, it does not cost us that much to forgive others. But forgiveness does cost us something. It costs us the right to get even. It can cost us our pride. But something really special happens when we choose to forgive. As difficult as it is. See, not only do we begin to experience peace in our lives and in our spirit and in our relationships, but when we choose forgiveness, we participate with God in his work of reconciling sinners to himself. And it takes humility, it takes mercy, it takes love. But reconciliation with our brothers and sisters in Christ is God's will for us. So earlier I mentioned that there was a second illustration that I would do as I taught our youth about some of the traps that we encounter and our need for wisdom and discernment in this life. And I thought I would illustrate this for you by bringing some of these traps with me. Now, unforgiveness is one of those traps. And when we choose to live in unforgiveness, in anger, in bitterness, in hurt toward those who have wronged us or even those who have just bugged us, it's like trying to navigate a minefield. And if you step in the wrong place, you're going to be triggered by anger or hurt or attitudes you don't want. And then you'll go and pass along those same feelings. And so here are a few examples of ways that we are prone to experience offense from others. As I was practicing this morning, I accidentally snapped one on my thumb. So today I'll try not to. Or I mean this, well, now. But, for example... The person at work who's always bragging about how great they are. That can bug a person. Oh, there's lots of people at work. This one who's always spouting off their crazy political views. That ever bug people? Yeah. Another trap that we can have to avoid. And then there's, uh, oh, this one gets a bit more personal. That old friend from high school who stopped hanging out with me because he found a cooler group to hang out with. Abandonment, being left out is not fun. Then there's that person who overstepped and disrespected me. And that person who made fun of me for so long, some of that stuff can linger with us for a long time. Oh, and then there's all those family members who excluded me because I have different views on topics that hardly even matter anymore. And then there's this one. 
I don't really want to talk about this one out loud. Last time in youth we did this, and Tanner was my guy who uh, helped me out, but I don't think he's here this morning. I won't ask for any volunteers, but navigating these traps is not easy. See, when I illustrate this with the youth, I'd ask for a volunteer. Tanner was that guy last time. And what I would do is I would invite him to uh, be blindfolded and barefoot, and then walk through the maze of traps that I set up. But then what I would do is I would tell this person just to listen to my voice as I guided him through. But what I would also do is to kind of illustrate this well, is I would invite the youth to kind of whisper bad instructions to them as well, to try to get them to step onto a trap. Whisper, yell, I'm not sure it all happened, maybe both. It was not very nice, and it made for walking through that maze quite difficult and quite stressful. But it illustrates so well how this works in our lives because our great enemy, Satan, the schemer, the accuser, the deceiver, the liar, he tries to lead us into those traps. And he tries to convince us that what the other person has done is so bad that it should never be forgiven or forgotten. That person should pay for it forever. And what Satan doesn't tell you is that he wants to rob you of your joy and your peace. And he wants you to live in anger and bitterness. And he wants to continually remind you of how you have been hurt and offended. And Satan doesn't tell you that this forgiveness will also cause you to become increasingly offended by more and more things in life. But as we spend time in the Word of God, as we, as we surrender ourselves to the authority of Scripture, as we listen to the Holy Spirit, He guides us through these traps. And as we surrender our hurts and our burdens to Jesus, as we forgive people who have wronged us, Jesus goes ahead of us and begins to disarm those traps. And I believe like so many of these things, forgiveness begins in prayer. And so this person who was always bragging about how great they are, I know this wasn't personal, but it sure does bug me. But I don't want to live in that tension. So God, I forgive this person and to help me to love them. And for this other person at work who is always spouting off their crazy political views. Lord, I want to love them. And so God, I release these feelings to you. Help me to forgive. And this old friend from high school who was always making, who abandoned me for a new group. Didn't realize how much that still hurt. Not the snap, but that but I forgive this person for how they've made me feel. And suddenly there's less traps to work through. And this other person who overstepped and disrespected me, God, I forgive this person for how they have frustrated me and caused me to feel. And for this person who made fun of me for so long. Lord, I know that you experienced the same kind of stuff when you walked this earth. So Lord, I forgive this person. Help me to surrender this to you. And my family members who excluded me for different views I have on topics that hardly even matter anymore. Lord, I want to love my family. I desire reconciliation, and I know that is what you desire too. Therefore, I forgive them for how they made me feel. And for this one, I don't really want to talk about it out loud. What this person has done 
has robbed me of so much for so long. But Jesus, you have forgiven me for so much. And for that reason, I want to forgive as well. So help me to truly forgive this person. When it comes to the topic of forgiving one another, there are countless scenarios. Those are some. Sometimes attitudes and actions need to be called out and recognized before full reconciliation can take place. And this is the example we see in this passage in in 2 Corinthians. And this can require so much wisdom and godly counsel. And this is the wisdom that Paul is extending to the church in Corinth in this passage. But when we have surrendered these feelings in prayer, we are in so much better place to work through this when we are confronted with, with the situation. And sometimes what forgiveness needs is for you to be the first one to apologize. Therefore, it is good for us to invite the Spirit to reveal to, to us anyone that we need to apologize to. And if, you've know you've, if you know you've wronged someone else, confess it. Stop hiding. Stop ignoring it. Recognize your own sin and own it and apologize. And it doesn't have to be long-winded. What I did was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It takes humility to do this, but it can be such a huge help and big step in pursuing peace. Forgiveness is not easy. And there can be complex personal scenarios that you are wrestling with. Therefore, I invite you to share those with trusted people. I invite you to invite those people to pray for you. See, forgiveness has never been easy. But we serve a Lord and a Savior who led the way. Jesus not only told us to forgive, he not only showed us how to forgive, through his sacrifice he also has forgiven us for all the many sinful and selfish things that we have done. Therefore, let us participate with God in this beautiful work of forgiveness and reconciliation. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for that you came to this, into our lives, into our world, that you gave your life to make a way for us to be saved, for us to be forgiven, for us to be reconciled to you, God. And I pray that you would help us to live that way for others. We thank you, Lord, for your love. And we need that. We need your Spirit's help, Lord, as we navigate the difficult times in our lives. For your glory, with your help. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.